Did you know that Title VII of the United States Code, Section 8313A1B, allows for a five-year sentence in the federal slammer for selling llama poop? Are you aware that Title 21, Part 139 of the Code of Federal Regulations prohibits the sale of improperly shaped spaghetti noodles? Or that the Swine Health Protection Act forbids the feeding of garbage to a pig unless said garbage has been cooked by a garbage cooker who holds a garbage cooking permit? You didn't know any of these things, but that's because you're not Mike Chase, criminal defense attorney and author of the new book, How to Become a Federal Criminal, an illustrated handbook for the aspiring offender. Perhaps the world's foremost expert on vague and dumb laws, the man behind the Crime A Day Twitter handle has scoured through countless criminal statutes and codes in order to demonstrate the power of the federal government at its most absurd. I sat down with Chase to learn the roots of his obsession with laws against improperly shaped cheese, whistling on a CB radio, and making unreasonable gestures to a passing horse. How to Become a Federal Criminal is sort of the desk guide to all of the most arcane and ridiculous federal crimes that you could commit in the United States. And, and they're a combination of statutory violations and, and regulatory violations, but things like selling grated cream cheese or you know, walking on the grass at the Capitol, things like that. What are some of the more ridiculous ones? Can you give us more, some more examples? Because some of them are really pretty hilarious. A personal favorite of mine is giving an unreasonable gesture to a passing horse on, uh, on in a national park. And uh, the law doesn't define what an unreasonable gesture is. And, and so you can kind of get creative, I think. Um, and I go through a few of my ideas for, for obscene gestures that you could make to a horse in the book, mm -hmm. but uh, the regulators don't give you sufficient guidance, and, and, and in a lot of cases, all Congress does is basically say, hey, look, any violation of any regulation that the Secretary of the Interior makes, you know, that's a federal crime. And so uh, oftentimes you have to go all the way to the Supreme Court to find out whether you've committed a crime or not. It is a pretty hilarious book. A lot of the, even the illustrations and the examples are very, very funny. Um, but I'm curious, like, there's a serious undercurrent to this, right? I mean, why, why does this all matter? Is it, is it just shits and giggles or are there, is there some kind of underlying importance to all this? There really is a serious underpinning. I mean, people have been giving different names to it. We've talked about executive overreach. We've talked about overregulation, overcriminalization. There's a whole bunch of names for it. But the truth is that when the country was founded, there were basically three federal crimes and a government of limited powers. So it was treason, counterfeiting, and being a pirate basically were the crimes. And for a long time after that, maybe the total crimes on the federal books were about 20. But now some scholars have estimated that that number exceeds 300,000. And, and here's really what the problem is. The problem is if you can't know whether you're committing a crime or not, uh, is it really a crime? And how much respect for the more morally offensive laws on the books uh, will there be? If, if you can never really know if you're committing a crime. Yeah, and for each law that uh, you mention, as nutty as it is, you really do go into how we got into this mess to begin with. Right, the, the, the funny thing is with all this law, right, with all this regulation and all this statute, it's, it's very hard for a person to say what's in the books and what's, what's there. And so people sort of line up on different sides of the debate. They either say regulation is inherently good or regulation is inherently bad. And the answer is it's really a mix. Sometimes a law is really truly trying to protect people from some harm out there, but maybe it goes too far. Um, maybe it misses the mark. Maybe it's been applied unconstitutionally. And so it was important to delve into the reasons for these laws because some are well-intentioned, but, but they may be overbroad, too vague, or, or outdated. And as ridiculous as they are, nobody sets out to like make a preposterous law and put it on the books. What is the source of a lot of these? There are certain categories that seem to provoke bizarre laws. We all know that the Constitution gives Congress certain powers, right? They can regulate commerce, they can regulate the high seas, you know, they can, certain territories, right? Commerce being probably the most broad statutory authority but they basically give blank checks to agencies and say, hey, look, any violation of any regulation on a particular topic that, that you write, uh, that's criminally enforceable. And so where the action is, I'll say, is food, uh, you know, public land on the high seas, 
uh, and money, for example, obviously is, a, is another place. And, and why my personal favorites is in the mail, right? Because everything that passes through the mail is potentially a federal crime. And poop. Poop is uh, on the top of my list of things. Poop and animal semen are about the, the best kind of crimes that you can commit because uh, there's a shockingly high number of poop and semen crimes on the books. Congress does seem to have a, some sort of scatological fixation with llama poop, right? The shoveling llama poop in wrong places could be a federal offense. Any llama that comes to this country has a mandatory quarantine period when they get here. It's like 30 days or something like that. And you cannot go visit your llama without permission. And that can be a heartbreaking time in any llama owner's life, obviously. But if you want to bring home some poop, mm -hmm. you know, uh, just to remind you of your llama, that is a quarantine violation. Are these special interests drawing these laws? Where, what, is, what is the sort of genesis of a lot of them? I will admit there's not a llama poop special interest, right? But yeah, the genesis of a lot of regulations are special interests. So here's a great example, right? One of the earliest kind of federal crimes that came about that was a violation of these regulations made by executive branch agencies was in margarine. And anybody can guess where the margarine regulation came from. It was big butter, right? And so the dairy industry came in and they said, uh, we don't like this new kid on the block. It's every bit as tasty as our product and people seem to not know the difference in mind and it's cheaper. And so the dairy lobby went to Washington and said, we need uh, comprehensive butter control. And they got it. They got a, a butter bill passed. It actually was a law called an act defining butter. And, and it required all kinds of crazy things. And, and some of it remains on the books today. Interesting. And like the bacon law, right? The, the packaging for bacon. I found that really interesting. It explained a long time fascination as to why <laughs> right. every package of bacon, you can actually see the bacon in it. Yeah, the bacon window. Yeah, I, the bacon window, yes. I, I call it the window of truth because I think that it really is the purpose that it serves. And, and yeah, of course, it's, it's to tell the consumer, hey, uh, this is how fatty the bacon you are getting. And it has to be a representative slice, right? They can't just put the, the good stuff on top. And so, you know, that's why that window appears. You know, it's shocking to me that there's not a window on potato chip bags so that you can see that there's only six potato chips in the bag. But so far, we've got the bacon rule. We've heard a lot of criticism in the Trump administration about this thing called the administrative state, right? This idea that it's not lawmakers making the laws, that our elected representatives with a sense of uh, discussion and debate and due process, but they're outsourcing things to agencies and federal bureaucracies that are actually making the real details of the laws. And that's ultimately what really matters. Is that an implicit critique that you're making in, the, in this book? Yeah, I mean, look, Article 1, Section 1 of the United States Constitution says that Congress has the lawmaking power, period, full stop. It's not theirs to give away, and that's something called the non-delegation doctrine, which has sort of been dormant or dead for a number of decades. But the truth is, it is Congress's job to make the law. They're the lawmaking branch. That's why we call them lawmakers. But they have given away, they've ceded that authority to executive branch agencies. So now you have the enforcers also doing the, the regulating, the lawmaking. So they're both picking what is a violation of the law and then prosecuting those violations of the law. And to be fair, like not all the laws in your book are bad necessarily. Like th the law thre against threatening clowns, that's a good law. Sure, I'm pro-clown. I'm, I'm definitely pro-clown. Uh, almost anything can be considered a drug paraphernalia, though, mm -hmm. right? That's, that some of those laws are like just overly vague in that way, right? Anything can be drug paraphernalia. If anybody who had a creative roommate in college knows that anything can be drug paraphernalia. Yeah, but there's a couple of categories that uh, that Congress has specifically articulated, like miniature spoons that are less than one-tenth of a cubic centimeter in level capacity. And uh, that actually derives from some interesting congressional testimony about the McDonald's McSpoon, which was used to stir coffee. No, no I'm very glad they're spending a, a lot of time on this kind of stuff. Uh, and it's not just Congress, right? Like you mentioned the Powell decision. Right. The Supreme Court spends a shocking amount of time discussing these sort of absurd laws. Uh, why are they doing that? Is there, underneath these absurd laws, are there like crucial constitutional questions at play? Sure, there often are. I mean, it, one of the main constitutional questions that occurs, not just at the federal level, but at the state level as well, is this question of void for vagueness, right? Unconstitutional vagueness. And, and so, yeah, in the Powell decision, the statute basically said any concealable firearm. And so that, that's a crime to mail. You can't mail a concealable firearm. So you and I think, well, that's clearly a pistol or some small gun that I can put on my body. But in the Powell decision, 
the court was looking at a 22 and a half inch sawed off shotgun that was sent through the mail. And they said, well, look, if you dress appropriately, you could probably conceal that. And so I don't know what the limits are. There's some big people out there. They could hide a lot of stuff. And so it's those kind of vague terms that often pique the court's interest. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, what is your, are you an expert in, why are you an expert in these absurd laws? Why should we uh, take your opinion seriously about this crazy stuff? I don't know if anybody should take my opinion seriously about this, but I will tell you that I'm, I'm fun at parties because I spend all my time reading the Code of Federal Regulations in the U.S. Code. And so the, what really it is, is it's just I've committed to the grunt work of going through all of these pages and reading all these sections and subsections and subparagraphs. So, you know, by day I'm a white collar criminal defense lawyer, that's what they say, but I mean, I'll defend anybody for anything. But, but the truth is that I, by night, have been spending a lot of time trying to count the number of crimes because the Department of Justice said that they couldn't do it. They tried in the 80s and quit. And so I said, look, if I do one a day, I'll only need like 800 years to finish the job, and, and then I'll be able to say that I counted them all. So that's what I've been doing. That's what Twitter is for, ultimately. Twitter is for that and destroying other people, just <laughs> absolutely destroying them. Yeah. <laughs> Which continues to be legal. Right, exactly. At least for the time being. Right. Uh, and, and so you do mention in the beginning of the book, like this is a, you, like it's a, almost like a legalistic di disclaimer, like this book is a book of humor and not serious legal advice. Right. Is there some, uh, why I, like I couldn't figure out why you didn't put that in there. Is, that, is there some law insisting that you, is someone, someone to sue you if they thought, oh, this is legal advice, I should commit all these 800 crimes? The truth is, if somebody comes to me and says, uh, is it illegal to X, right, whatever the, the blank is filled with, the answer is, I don't know. I can't, I can't sign a piece of paper that says, hey, it's totally legal to do any particular thing because you can't read all the laws. I haven't gotten through all of them yet, even though I've been doing it for five years. And so I think what's important is for people who read the book to know it's a work of humor. Don't do anything in the book. Uh, yeah, you're probably not going to get charged for selling, you know, runny ketchup, but you could. And <laughs> right, we'll talk about that later. But uh, but yeah, it's it, it, it's important that people know that the truth is that the specter of criminal liability hangs over all of us all the time. And that's why people find themselves before the courts and even the Supreme Court. Are people often even charged with these crimes or is it extremely rare? So it depends which crimes you're talking about. I mean, you know, we expect prosecutors to exercise something called prosecutorial discretion. What that ends up meaning is that they charge mostly gun crimes, drug crimes, immigration crimes, and fraud crimes. That's overwhelming majority of it. Now, say the estimates are one and a half to two percent of the federal docket is filled with these administrative crimes, right? Violations of regulations. That's still thousands of people each year. That's thousands of lives. People who have to get a lawyer, go to court, potentially appeal after a conviction, maybe try to go to the Supreme Court to find out if it's unconstitutional. And so, yeah, people are charged with them. And I go through a couple of examples in the book of people who were charged with things that they never thought would be a federal crime, maybe maybe a, a violation or a, a small state misdemeanor or something of that effect, but not something that would get them a federal criminal record. Is it like if a federal prosecutor wants to throw the book at you, they will add these charges on? If a federal prosecutor wants to throw the book at you, it's my book that they throw. Um, but yes, it, it really, there's a coercive element to it, right? So. If it, we look at these right now, the, all the discussion is about process crimes, right? People talk about obstruction of justice. They talk about lying to federal agents. The truth is if they can't get you on a substantive crime that everybody agrees is morally reprehensible, they can often get you on lying to the feds mm -hmm. because they decide what's a lie. They decide whether they think that you are being truthful or not. And it's incumbent upon you to defend yourself in, in federal court. And, and so, yeah, uh, if you go into a meeting with federal prosecutors, Nobody can tell you that you're not admitting to a federal crime when you describe something that you did because you may not know whether there's a federal regulation or a statute that covers that conduct, and that's a problem. And you can actually learn a lot about the legal and judicial philosophies of different administrations based on this stuff. Like, for example, the Obama administration was quite fond of the MBTA, the Migratory Bird Act. Right. The Migratory Bird Treaty, Treaty Act. Treaty Act, right. thank you. And then the Trump administration looked at that same law and said, no, we, that's vague and ridiculous and we should strike that down. Uh, is, is, that, is this a window onto different uh, administrations? MBTA 
day situation is one example where, yes, the Obama administration said accidental bird deaths. So if you get a you know really clean plate glass window and an egret flies into your window and breaks its neck, can you technically be charged? Yes, Obama administration said, but we're going to trust prosecutors not to charge those more ridiculous cases. And, and, and including, you know, during the Obama administration, uh, a utility was charged for a bunch of birds dying in windmills accidentally. Nobody tried to kill those birds. But then the Trump administration looked at it and said, well, wait a second. This is the epitome of vague law. If, if, if we've just ceded what's a crime and what's not a crime to the executive branch, that's sort of overbroad and impermissible. So we're issuing new guidance saying that those kind of accidental bird deaths are not crimes. Now, nothing in the law changed. Nothing Congress passed changed. You could go look at the text and see the same words, but two different administrations have said one is a crime and one's not a crime without a change in the law. But what I will tell you is the same Trump administration has used the regulatory power to create and change crimes on the books as well. We saw the bump stock ban in in March. And basically with the stroke of a pen, essentially doing the exact same thing that the Obama administration was criticized for, the Trump administration made a whole new class of previously legal products into criminal contraband and without going through the legislative process. So every administration is guilty of it in some respect. It's maybe a question of degree. It was the Department of Justice the, that issued the regulation. They changed the regulation that interpreted what a machine gun is. So essentially by changing the definition of a machine gun, they created a whole new class of crime. So on day one, you could have legally possessed it. On day two, you were a federal criminal. Why did you dedicate this book to the US Congress? Like any you know, great comedian, I have ghostwriters, and Congress is my ghostwriter. I couldn't have done any of the book without them. Um, and, and it's because uh, really what they've done is, uh, again, I don't think anybody's intentionally created the more ridiculous crimes. A lot of them have been created by accident, right? The Congress writes a law that says any violation, that's a crime. And then the regulators go about their business making regulations. And then somebody sits down, like me, uh, and they start tweeting about it, and they go, Technically, you know, you made it a crime to, uh, you know, submit a stamp in the migratory bird stamp contest and you use computer generated art and you're not allowed to use that. You have to paint a duck or something like that. But, but the truth is they're not looking to create crimes all the time, but they do. And they should be, Congress should be more careful about giving away that criminal enforcement power. What can be done about this? Is there is there a law, another law that needs to be passed? What? How, how can we slow this sort of thing down? Congress can go through and look at the statutes that I cite in the book that give away this blanket criminal enforcement power to the agencies. And then it can maybe take a look at those statutes. Because remember, the reason that there's 300,000 federal crimes is not because of criminal statutes, right? There's maybe a couple thousand federal criminal statutes. But if they go through those few that give away this blanket authority to regulators to make crimes and change that so that it's required that if something's going to be criminally punished, it must specifically say so in the act. That would eliminate a huge number of these federal crimes, right? In order for a regulator to make it a crime, it has to specifically say so, and Congress needs to approve it. That would be a, a good step in the right direction. Congress can also look at bad regulations and use this little used act called the Congressional Review Act, and they can go through and, and look at the regulations and say, we disagree and we're overriding this regulatory action. But they don't like to do that because it's not politically popular to do it. And you did all the illustrations in this book, and the illustrations are really wonderful. They You have really captured that kind of soul-sucking, bureaucratic uh, diagram that tells people that are, tells people what to do and how to do it, right? right. Yeah. Uh, is, is that the look you were going for? Yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and, and in fact, if you walk through the Code of Federal Regulations, you'll even see some similar type illustrations. It's just this government, you know, no joy, uh, expressionless, sometimes faceless figure doing some prohibited act. Yeah, no color either. That's very important. Yeah, that's very important. Yeah, yeah color, color might might suggest hope or some sort of positivity, and I wanted to crush that, stamp that out of the yeah. reader. Yeah, that made me feel good. Yeah. <laughs> Mike Chase, thank you very much. The book is How to Be a Federal Criminal, and it's out in bookstores? June 4. Very good. I'm Todd Crane for a reason. Uh -huh.